sort of explain things to people. Although I'm not an academic, I'm not a linguist, I'm not, but you know, in my own way it's been what I've had to do. And particularly when you're new here, everything's new, you sort of look for reasons for things, you sort of feel you start to get to know it. But I found even today, after 30 odd years, I get baffled. But it's another thing that I like. So the emotion and the bafflement, that combination, I really, it's why I really love being here. Um, so, um, the, the, when I talk, let me sort of try and explain what I mean by bafflement. When you're baffled by something, it's not, I, had a, I had a thing in the middle of my reporting career here. I was sent on a trip to Indonesia for six weeks reporting. And this was, I forget, this was like 1999, I think it was, when all the riots were. And I found going around talking to Indonesians and to expats, um, you know, bankers, business people, journalists, politicians, I very quickly got answers to questions. Why is this happening? It sort of became very clear. Um, whereas when I come back to Korea, I still get baffled all the time by, by things, you know. And I'll give you some examples uh, a bit later. Um, you would sort of hope that um, a part of the bafflement would be alleviated by um, our English language newspapers here. Um, but it, they don't help. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not criticising our beloved papers because we all love them to bits, but um, they're Korean newspapers written for Koreans. Um, they just happens to be in English. And so we're kind of, we're looking, we're sort of looking, bystanders sort of looking on. And uh, so you don't get a lot of um, elucidation. There's actually a piece in the Korea Times today, interestingly, um, by Judge Huang Jumyong about Korean attitudes to law. And this is the first time I've seen something like that. Uh, and attitudes to law is one of the examples of bafflement. It, it's like puzzling. Um, so the Korean papers, the, the people who work in the Korean papers are not very aware of what baffles foreigners, and therefore they don't seem to need to explain things. So I want to label that point too long. Yet, so. so here's some examples. Um, early, early bafflement. Um, some of you might remember this incident. This is May 1985, when um, we had sort of four or five years of Chunduan. Uh, this country was a thorough military dictatorship then. It was, when you see people in the street, when they're in the shops, when they're having fun, when they're getting drunk, it's just like they are today. I mean, there, there's liveliness. It's not like North Korea, where they're all sort of, kind of going like this. Um, it's very lively. But in certain spheres, you talk to people about unification. No, you can get arrested for talking about that. Uh, you try and get people to critic. You could get arrested for criticizing American government policy, even American government policy. Um, this sort of thing. So, in the political area, it was a thorough dictatorship, um, and the police also didn't bother them, sort of slapping people around and things like. Unless you're a foreigner, you don't get slapped. Unless you're a white foreigner, you don't get slapped around. If you're an Asian foreigner who they think is Korean. Um, you know, it happened a lot to photographers in the foreign press, Japanese photographers and people like that. So, but then this thing happened. What it was was the, you know that building opposite the entrance of the Lotte Hotel? That used to be the American Cultural Center on the second floor. And these students burst in there and occupied the place for three days. And the press was across the road from where this, by the Lotte sign, this picture was taken, sort of cameras. I remember seeing Korea. I mean, I remember feeling like oh, this is appalling. You know what they're doing. It was kind of a bit shocking. And they spread. Um, if I remember rightly, uh, maybe that's a later one at Amcha. I think they spread kerosene or something on the floor and said that if you, if the police come in, we're going to burn ourselves or something. I can't remember exactly, but it was. They were threatening to jump and th you know, things like that. Um, and when the cameras were, we were also watching the you know, the. There'd be Koreans going by, going, and you could see that there was something inside them, not all of them, but the people going, 
And then if they came up to a foreign journalist who they felt was friendly, they'd start going, oh, it's crazy, isn't it? It's really crazy. You know, that, that's what it is. And what, I'm getting to the battle a bit in a minute. What, what, uh, what I found was the people around me, I mean, obviously there were people who were pro-democrats, some of them still in prison, uh, and things like that. Ordinary people was sort of a bit apolitical and pro-government, pro-America, pro-unification, all these sort of things. Suddenly, all those people around me started uh, talking about democracy. And it was as if uh, this event, a divine hand had sort of come down and switched something on, gone back again. And the thing that bit that baffled me was nobody explained it to me. They acted as if they'd always been like that. It's sort of the way that you find after the country was liberated, everybody was pro-liberation. Well, I'm sorry they weren't. But the, there was sort of, so many people were democratic. And a year later, this was an anti-American, you can see actually one of the slogans up there is, I can't read it all, but there's me with something. Um, and Tejin, I presume that means Chung Du Wan stepped down. So it was primarily an act against Chung, but the theme was American. But what <coughs> happened, oh, we'll come to this one in a minute. Um, what happened in the next year was that US trade pressure started on South Korea. And that had a similar effect of turning all these ordinary folk around me into anti-Americans. All these, uh, I'm not talking about kids on the street who were ideologically anti-American, just all these people decided to moan to me all the time about America. And it was this pressure from the, the trade pressure. And again, it wasn't explained as, oh, because of the trade pressure, I feel that da, da, da. it was like, I'd always been like this. Um, and so, I don't know if I'm convincing you, but these things baffled me. Now, here's some examples of other things that have baffled me. Um, the comfort women. Okay. Um, I don't want to sound like an asshole, basically. Um, although I can be at times. Um, but I, I appreciate that the comfort women was a horrible thing. I appreciate that. Uh, it's terrible. And it, it makes you weep when you read these stories of people. But what I don't get is why it's center stage as an issue. And the reason is I compare it with, you imagine, under the Japanese occupation here, if a bunch of people were protesting outside the French embassy about the attack on Kanwado in 1860s. That was 70 years earlier. That was very violent. That was imperialistic. People died. What do you think? You'd sort of think, is somebody paying you to do this? Is somebody paying you to try and distract away from the main issue onto the French. Now, I'm not suggesting that. It's just, it, it puzzles me of why, when there are so many current issues, why this historical issue from fascist Japan, which is no longer fascist, 70 years ago, at a time when the horrible things were happening all over the world, is so important now. Um, Similarly, Dr. Um, Dr. is, uh, and I know for expats, um, and I forg the Koreans here must forgive us, but Dokto is the subject of a lot of jokes among expats, and the reason is that we don't actually get it. I'm sorry, we don't get it. Um, I can see a uh, dispute. There are a lot of disputes. There are disputes, there are, there are similar disputes between Canada and America. There's a whole list on, on Wikipedia of disputed islands around the world. Um, Japan is one of Korea's closest allies. Okay. Fine, we've got a bit of a dispute. Korea run, has the island. Japan's not going to attack it. But um, still, sometimes I even get the feeling this issue is more emotionally more important than the North Korean gulag is. Seriously. It inflames something that the North Korean offences don't inflame. And I find that uh, very, very puzzling. 
and I wonder if the grandchildren of modern Koreans might not get it. That might be puzzled as well. It's like, what, well, granddad, you were, you were alive when the Kims ruled in North Korea? What was it like? You know, what did you do? Could you smell the gulag from over the DMZ? Uh, no, son, I was busy defending Tokto against an invasion by our second closest ally. <laughs> okay, granddad, do you take drugs in those days? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, how do you explain that? Um, so, uh, moving on. Um, you might remember this one, this is another one, although I think this is less, ba it was baffling at the time. It was more understandable because I think it was a fake news issue, frankly. There were a lot of youngsters out there demonstrating who, this was sort of around when um, text messaging was really taking over as an alternative to real news. And a lot of them actually believed that Korea had agreed to take beef from America that was deemed unfit for American Americans, and it was going to be served up in their schools. They actually believed that. Um, Scott bless them. Um, and this one, um, this, the, the, in 2002, the, the, long, the old hands here will remember this very well, uh, right at the end of the World Cup. The World Cup was a wonderful moment for, for this country and it was, it was a, a changing, a point of change in many regards. Um, but at the end of it, there was this horrendous accident uh, where an American military vehicle in live exercises. And in, in Korea, the uh, military vehicles are allowed to go on public roads during exercises, which in other, a lot of other countries are not. I think that might have changed now, I'm not sure. But there was this massive vehicle going through a town, a village, and there were two little girls who heard the noise and they crouched down beside a building because the driver couldn't see them and he killed them. Uh, it, was, it was horrible. Um, and uh, I later found out, the fact, I think, and I think you told me this, the, the first candlelit vigil that US took troops. place was by US troops the following night. Um, you know, so, but what happened was partly sort of just uh, mass emotion, partly disinformation, that a lot of Koreans were led to believe this was a deliberate act. Like, um, hey, Harry, you have girls over there? You know, is it? Is it as if you could really contemplate that happening, but people believed it was. And, and so the demonstrations were huge, uh, enormous for this. Um, and, but it was over this issue that I had a personal um, epiphany a revelation. Um, and that was this. It was foreigners like me, and me and the people that I sort of drink beer with, um, and this is an expat phenomenon around the world, is you're moaning away about something. And the thrust of your moaning is you want to change the country. You know, you know why, why they don't invite a bunch of us, why the, the president doesn't invite a group of us into the Blue House to be his advisors, because we know it all. Um, I don't know, but it never seems to happen. Um, and you, you sort of, it's this idea you want to change them, you want them to change. Why do they do this? Why do the cars park on the sidewalk and people walk on the road? They should change that. Um, and, but when this happened, there was a moment where 50, one day, 50,000 or so demonstrators stomped over a Stars and Stripes that was lying in the road outside City Hall, this was before there was all grass there. And in response to that, there were some uh, editorials and opinion columns in US newspapers, I think it was one in the New York Times, basically saying, um, interpreting this and saying, is this like the Philippines? I mean, if, if we're not wanted, maybe we should leave. Um, and that, that theme led to more anti-American demos. But this time, the, the, the message in the demos was, was different. It was demonstrating against Americans for failure to understand our anti-Americanism. <laughs> it, it was at that point 
I gave her. <laughs> you know, they say they say in a relationship that um, that the moment where um, you really love somebody is when you stop trying to change them. And I'm going to pause for effect while the women in the room take this in. Um, the, um, and that was for me the point where I stopped trying to change career. I just thought, okay, and, and, and the second, mo second part of that moment was I sort of went out to the demos and there was a bunch of uh, very angelic looking nuns um, near the embassy in a sort of demo wearing a badge saying, excuse me, fucking USA. And I thought, oh, goodness, I'm not going to try and change you. I, 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 I accept you as Zen. I became a Buddhist, I said, I actually, you know, it's like, I became a therapist instead of a, would, a wannabe policy maker. You know, that was the moment that happened. So, but to return to the public sentiment theme, um, I think these knots, and, and what I'm telling you is very, a lot, I'm, I'm not a very, I don't consider myself a very astute person, and I, I don't. I tend to learn by experience. If I read more, I might have understood these things that baffled me. A lot of you guys are probably not baffled. These things have baffled me. I, if I could have learned much better, but it was this very slow process. But I now think that they all seem to come back to a common thread, which is public sentiment. Um, so. Um, that was the, one of the flag stomping moments, I think. Um, so, let's talk about public sentiment, minchin in, in Korean. I'd heard this term uh, before, you know, you see it in the newspapers. It's come to, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln is famous for a quote about public sentiment, uh, which I won't quote you because that undermines my argument. Because um, he said it's a good thing. Um, but, um, I sort of thought, okay, this is reverse to kind of pop, uh, popular opinion. It's like public opinion, you know, popular opinion with a bit of popular emotion. But I only really started to appreciate the significance of it uh, when I became, when I started working in public relations as opposed to journalism. And this especially came up in meetings with lawyers. Now, in, in public relations, like in, when companies get into trouble, when companies have crises, They'll often get a team together of the PR folk who, who are concerned about the reputational fallout for whatever's happening, and the lawyers uh, and other people like that. So you get into a team. And the people who kept talking about public sentiment were the lawyers. Um, and uh, it came up as an observation, not about media coverage, it wasn't like all public sentiments against us. Therefore, you media guys, you need to do your job better. It wasn't that. It was public sentiment against us. Therefore, the judge in the case is probably going to rule against us. So the fact that, uh, so we think asking for a delay is a good strategy because by stringing the process out, public sentiment can shift onto something. You know. So in other words, what they were saying was, um, the, the legal decision makers are very influenced by public sentiment. Now you may be sitting there thinking, so what? So but bear with me on this. Um, and I also first heard the thing in English where they said, the law of public sentiment is above the law. And of course there's no such thing as the law of public sentiment. In other words, public sentiment overrides the law. But they didn't sort of say it like to their foreign clients like um, by the way you have to understand in Korea the, sort of, the notion of justice is such that da, 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 da. it was just um, talked about as a given you know? um, and that is because it's normal but it's also and this is what I'm going to try and argue it's a symptom of a very profound weakness in Korean democracy um, so to argue that point, let's, uh, let's be clear what we're talking about. What is public sentiment? So here's the definition that I'm going with. And if anyone wants to prove on it, you're welcome. It's basically a prevailing view that has such emotive force that it gives it the appearance of perhaps being a unanimous view, nearly unanimous. 
um, and is strong enough to overwhelm decision making by being unanimous, but it's not. Um, indeed, there are times when, when public sentiment, the, the view of oh, public sentiment says this, may actually be a minority view. And I'll give you an example. Well, actually, I don't know if this is an example. I'm just. Uh, uh, it's an example that Andy, Andy Sam and I work in the same office, which is right over there, and the Comfort Women statue is right down here. So every Wednesday there's a big loud demo that we hear from our office. And we we'll often wonder why, why does nobody, if this was in London, actually no, English people are a bit polite. If it was in Edinburgh, no, Glasgow, if it was in Glasgow, <laughs> there's a Comfort Women statue in Glasgow. People were shouting there. People were like, oh, shut up, you bastard. You know, they'd be stopping and sort of remonstrating with these people, arguing with them, and, and calling the police and saying, I'm fed up with this. And I get to, they've got these horrible loudspeakers, can't they? But in Korea, everyone's sort of quite quiet about it. But I bet if you polled everybody, and if you put the idea in their head with the question, don't you think these should, people should be protesting about something else? You'd probably get a majority would say yes. Isn't Japan a very close ally? Yes. Do you hate Japan? No. You know. So it, it needn't be unanimous, but pervading public sentiment gives the feeling that it is. Um, and I think one of the most serious aspects of it is, is that it overwhelms uh, decision making where it can. Um, so I want to talk, I was involved in this, I want to talk a little bit about this case. Um, if you ask anybody in Korea, this is a 10 year old case, if you ask anybody in Korea what they think of when you say Lone Star, um, the chances are uh, they'll come up with something very, very negative. You know, probably almost as bad as Hitler or something. Really, I mean, seriously, it was Lone Star had a horrible reputation. Um, just to remind, Lone Star was, or still is, was uh, an American f uh, a buy a fund, and their speciality is to look for bankrupt companies that nobody else wants to buy. Um, you get a bank that's bankrupt, no other bank is going to buy it, it's too much of a hassle. So you get these funds will come in, they'll buy the bank, turn it around in three years, and then sell it to a real bank for a profit. So they serve, that's what they call vulture funds, they serve a kind of a function like a vulture does, of sort of picking the, picking the dead meat off. Um, a vulture doesn't, anyway, you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> I was going to say then reviving the animal. <laughs> um, after you've eaten the, an the dead animal, then you revive it. Um, and then, you yeah. know, so they serve as a function. The thing is that at the time, uh, South Korean citizens were not, if, I, if I'm correct on this, South Koreans were not allowed to have private equity funds. So they actually didn't understand this mechanism, what it meant. Um, but in 2003, I think it was, um, Lone Star bought the Korea Exchange Bank. If you remember that time, in the Asian financial crisis, the country was on the brink of bankruptcy. They got 55 odd billion dollars, biggest ever payout from the World Bank, the IMF, um, and used it to save failed banks and, and some of the big channels. Lone Star bought the Korean Exchange Bank, which was bankrupt, for, at zero cost to the Korean taxpayer. So they were kind of heroes. Um, but uh, what happened in the process that they let go of uh, about six people? And these six heroes um, formed a, an NGO, whose name I forget, but it was something to the effect of an NGO to end speculation by foreign capital or something like that, um, with some professors. And they started protesting. The media loved them. And they pointed out to the press that, do you know, when Lone Star sells this bank, it will probably make a profit of about three to five billion dollars. Um, and these numbers seemed massive. I mean, in terms of percentage return, they weren't 
such a big deal, but in absolute numbers, there were huge numbers. And suddenly, the Korean press got the notion that this greedy capitalist fund was benefiting from the misery of the Korean people. And, to add insult to industry, because of these clever uh, Wall Street types um, are much smarter than we are, they set up the entity which bought the bank in Belgium, where there's a double taxation agreement. So the tax on, on the taxes would be paid in Belgium and not in Korea. So the, the public sentiment went berserk um, over this. And then uh, what actually happened was that prosecutors then started they went into Lone Star every day, investigating them. I mean, it took them months to, to learn the business. And they effectively brought Lone Star's business to a standstill. They harassed them, threatened them. The Korean staff got treated quite well. They weren't physically beaten, but they were psychologically treated very badly. Um, all the time, under, you know this theme of if you beat the coat and the dust comes out? Meaning that if if you go and invest, we're all guilty of something. If prosecutors tomorrow came in and started investigating me, they would get me on something. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I know what it is. Um, <laughs> you know that we've all got something. Um, that's the sort of the theory they have. So they were looking for something. Um, um, I'll come to the conclusion, and, and then the tax authorities felt a similar thing or public sentiment is pushing us to do something. So they started demanding taxes of local tax, local Seoul city um, and national taxes. Um, in the end, what they found, this all came down to a particular issue, which is a bit complicated, but I'll try and explain it in about 10 seconds or 20 seconds, which is that they were forced to buy when they bought the bank, they were forced to take responsibility for the, the KDB card unit, which they decided they didn't want because it was worthless. But the regulators pressured them and said, if you don't take responsibility for it, you will never get a card for that bank again and we'll make your life miserable. Gotcha. Okay, we'll do it. Um, the, this card unit was something like 60% owned by the bank, and the, the rest was owned by a couple of funds, and there was, some of it was 10 or 20% was public shared. So the Lone Star people said to their advisors in Korea, okay, what do we do? And they were advised by their lawyers to do a capital write-down, at which point they said, what is a capital write-down? I still don't know what it is, I can't explain it, but somebody here might be able to, but um, they didn't know what it was, so it was explained. Um, should we do this? Yeah, this is our recommendation. Okay. So they announce, the board announces, we're going to do a capital right now. Two days later, the lawyers come back and say, oh, um, we've just found out this process takes about six months. Uh, but we don't have six months. We're, this is almost bankrupt. We, we've got to do something. We've got to solve this problem in about two weeks. We don't have that time. So what are our options? Well, the only option left is to buy all the shares from the other people. Um, which is, so they then announced, we're going to buy all the shares from the other shareholders. But during that week, the share price, as you can imagine, because of the first announcement, had gone down. So the whole thrust of this investigation that went on for ages came down to the fact Lone Star deliberately announced the first announcement in order to bring the share price down before they bought everybody's shares. Do you get it? There wasn't a scrap of evidence that this is what the defense lawyers said. There was zero evidence. But the court decided that's what its motive was. And the Korean number two in the Korean office here got jailed for five years because of that. That's public sentiment. Okay. So I labored that one just to make the point. 
How, by the way, how does public sentiment manifest? I should have said this earlier. Uh, it's not purely media, especially nowadays. It's sort of a combination of uh, street demos, online commentary, media. Sometimes the media's behind it. Uh, I, I don't mean behind it, manipulate it. I mean, they're behind the curve, so they catch up. You know. Um, so let's get to his latest victims. Um, there you go. Um, you might be familiar with this one. If you were puzzled, and many of you may not be, uh, but if you were puzzled by both the justification for the impeachment and the speed with which it happened, um, then you'll find an explanation in this whole theme of public sentiment. If you recall, it was a JTBC television program that started this all off. It was the, um, what do you call them? Tablet. Tablet. A tablet, which has now been declared, it's, what does it end in? It's been declared not evidence or something. Uh, it wasn't that to be admitted as evidence, if I recall correctly. Okay, anyway. There was a tablet with some uh, presidential speeches that this lady had and like that. So that, the, the, the effect of that TV program was to make people feel um, that Papadé was sort of being manipulated like this by her friend. And this is why people were, this is what made people furious. It was kind of the breaking of, of a democratic deal, in my opinion. The deal being, okay, we're a democracy now, we elect you, We've still got our old sort of social ideas, so you swan around as if you're the most important person in the country. You've got men with muscles and things out the rear to and you come along, and you can be important. But we're in charge. And she seemed to break that. That there was somebody else sort of manipulating. That was the, the feeling. And for Christians, um, the added uh, bonus was that this lady was the daughter of a kind of shamanistic vicar um, who had seduced the young Miss Park spiritually, if not physically. I mean, there's some theories that there was a relationship there. But certainly manipulated her in her early days. And the view was that the daughter was sort of carry on that, carrying on that good work. So there was a bit of a... Uh, a shamanistic sort of evil uh, feeling there that they've got Christians going, although frankly I found other people didn't care about that. Um, uh, and so the people went berserk. Um, so, yeah. she's not going berserk, but you know what I mean. Uh, uh, actually, uh, actually, Andy and I, uh, sorry, I keep referring to Andy, we've had a big argument about this. I said, people are going berserk. He said, no, they're not. Uh, by berserk, I mean there's great passion that drives people to come up from the countryside and take part in all of this. There was huge passion, but the behavior was very civilized. Uh, and the police were wonderful. Uh, after the first demo, they were great. Um, so, um, but the fault here, in my opinion, is not media. The media had a scoop, went with it. Uh, the fault is not demonstrators. I mean, they felt something, they protested. They have a right to do that. It's a democracy. Um, and they don't know all the facts. Uh, we don't know all the facts when we, when we arrive at political opinions. When you, when you choose to vote for something, you don't know everything. This is politics. The theatre of politics is not a precise art. So, um, this is fine. Um, what made it significant for people, what made people take note, um, Apart from the sheer scale of it, um, was that the protesters were not your usual suspects uh, who would use any issue to attack the incumbent. It was ordinary people um, incensed at the idiot in the blue hats. Uh, I asked a taxi driver about three weeks into this, I asked a taxi driver, What are all your customers saying? And he said, Right now, every person, almost without fail, is saying, the president belongs not in a blue house, but in a mental hospital. There was a feeling that she was so weak that she was being kind of manipulated. So you remember that that was what started it. That theme now has disappeared, but that's what started it. 
Um, so, um, I believe that until this point everything was fine, but then I think that Korea's democracy was let down by its institutions, whose very weakness is that they are over-responsive to public sentiment, which is an ironic thing. So, the National Assembly, in my opinion, started it by impeaching the president. Why did they impeach the president? Because there were a million people on the street. That's, now, if you think that's normal, let me say it again. <laughs> they impeached the president because the people were shouting. That is not a reason. These people are lawmakers. That it doesn't matter if the people are shouting sometimes. You still do your job. The traffic lights don't stop working. Well, they do actually, but uh, the traffic lights don't stop working. The police don't stop policing. The shopkeepers don't stop, stop selling. You do your job. Um, you don't just think, um, oh, many people on the street go and impeach. That's what they did. Um, and, in my opinion, they came up with some rather silly pretexts for impeaching her. Um, so, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the characteristics of public sentiment is its power to silence opposition. And this uh, happens on two levels. It happens on a uh, sort of micro level. I mean, uh, I, know, I know people who share my concerns about this, which I hope by the end will become clear. But they say they can't talk to their Korean friends about it. Um, and at the same time, on a bigger level, the media doesn't discuss this. These pro-park group um, were quite small at the beginning, but they were significant from al almost, uh, I'd say a few weeks in, they became significant. It took the media a long time to take them seriously. They're being dismissed as nut jobs, and the fact that they were accusing everybody of being North Korean spies contributed to that, because that's sort of a wacko sort of thing to say. Um, they sort of they looked weird. They were adishes with unfashionable adishes with ill-fitting suits. They were old people. My father-in-law got so incensed about them that he firmly believes that old people should not be allowed to vote now. This is his new position. Um, uh, so, so why does why does public sentiment, when it's strong, have that effect of silencing people? I think one I think it comes from a combination of two things. One is the old notion of harmony, which sort of goes back to I mean, harmony is a good thing. We all like it, but it had a particular meaning in a Confucian society when. The, Society was disrupted, it was sort of an indicator that heaven was not happy with the ruler. So there was always a great effort um, to maintain harmony. So there's, there's a longing for harmony here. Uh, North Korea expresses it very well. You know, we think with one mind, we feel with one heart, that sort of thing. Um, and quite frankly, harmony, I mean, personally, uh, we all love it. I mean, there's nothing better than being um, at a rock concert when Jimi Hendrix is playing, of course, you're all too young for that. But, um, well, when Manchester United is playing, and there's tens of thousands of people around you all sort of moving as one. You know, these are great moments, but I think this sort of thing should be limited to sports, frankly. But anyway, um, the second thing is an education system that doesn't encourage, encourage debate, uh, frankly. And, and the media doesn't encourage debate. I mean, you get sort of talk shows and stuff, but I don't think there's great debates and arguments in the Korean media, particularly on things like this. Um, so, um, let me see, where did we go? Constitutional Court. I'm talking, by the way, I'm going round and round. I'm, I'm talking about institutions in which, in this case, follow the bidding of public sentiment. We have the National Assembly. Constitutional Court. It, I can say with all confidence now after the result, though I wasn't confident before it, um, it was a foregone conclusion that the Constitutional Court would uphold the impeachment. You know. Fortunately for the justices, they had a very broad brief. They had to decide was the president 
unfit to rule or not. That's it. You know, if someone goes nuts, <coughs> she's there sort of, sorry, no, that's a bit of a Donald Trump thing, to do what they want, which is to put this bitch behind bars. That's the deal. And the, the eventual pretext has, doesn't have to be in any way connected to the original thing that got them furious. You know? But if it got very clearly pointed out that, um, sorry, excuse me, Chesson Shill was asked for her opinion about a couple of appointments by the friend. And the president also asked her former professor and her old French boyfriend, who we still haven't found yet, but I'm sure he's out there somewhere. Um, and, um, you know, if, if the evidence was there that, that, that she wasn't manipulating the president, um, people wouldn't have gone, oh, uh, okay, we're wrong, we'll go home. You see what I mean? It was too late. The emotion just takes on a life of its own. Um, so the prosecution weren't able to do their job, and the, the special prosecutor actually apologized for being unable to, you know, complete his mission. Um, so now we're left with this. Look at this. Remember that? Okay. my opinion, I'm not going to ask you because I'm sure you disagree with me. Um, what lies behind these things? You know, justice in a democracy is supposed to be better than we are at our worst moments. You know, when we want to hang somebody, the justice system restrains us while, you know, evidence is collected, arguments are heard, uh, it allows the defendant to have a representative. Um, you know, and it punishes in, in accordance with the crime. Now, obviously, our judicial systems aren't perfect, and there's miscarriages of justice, but in principle, those principles are kind of lie behind democratic systems of justice. Um, I mean, uh, now, public sentiment and what society feels does get reflected in, in law, of course. Um, you know, things change. Like in, in old Korea, you can get executed for not performing your ancestral rights properly. In England, you could get arrested for blasphemy, but you probably still can. Parts um, of Birmingham. Um, but uh, so, so, when I see images like this, I feel this kind of beast of public sentiment, like some dragon with its hot breath on my neck or something. It, I find these images extremely disturbing. This man is the de facto head of the Samson group, one of the largest groups in the world. And he's got ropes around his wrists. What is that? What is, it? is he, is he going to stab one of his guards? Is he, has he got some evidence in his pocket he's going to rip up at the last minute? No. This is all designed to make him look guilty. It's designed to influence the outcome of the trial before it happens. Okay? Now the, 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 North, the prosecutors have jailed Chesun Shil, E. J. Yong, Park Dene. Why are these people in jail? There's two reasons to jail people in this situation. One is there might be a flight risk. The other is they might destroy evidence. Okay, Park Dene has had like six months to destroy evidence. The Samson group's probably got a massive kiln burning, you know. You know. Um, they're not going to go anywhere, these people. Um, so why are they in jail? Because, in my opinion, the prosecutor does not have evidence. So therefore, he has to, he is, he's taking another recourse, which is to force confession. And how do you do that? You isolate people psychologically. If Park is a weak-willed person, she's going to crack. You isolate them. You don't torture them anymore. This is what they used to do until recently. Um, you don't starve them. You don't force them to stay away. You isolate them. You give them the hot, cold treatment. Um, and what you're hoping is that one of them is going to go... And by the way, this whole thing, just like Lone Star, has come down to a very fine point. When Samson provided money 
for these two foundations, one was to promote Korean sports, one was to promote Korean culture, um, was there a deal? Okay, we'll put the money into this foundation, and in exchange, the Bloom House will get the National Pension Service to agree to the merger of the Samsung affiliates, which is what Samsung wanted. Was there a deal? I'm betting you there's no evidence, like there's not an email, there's not written documentation, there's not, a, there's not minutes from uh, meetings, there's no real evidence. If the evidence exists, it's up here in people's minds. So what you then want, you want somebody to crack. You want Park Dene to go, well, I kind of, I sort of went like that. <coughs> gotcha. You know, well, what I'm betting is that if that doesn't happen, if the three of them hold for, for they'll get them, Chase and Shield, they're going to get on peripheral stuff. She probably fiddled foreign currency or did all sorts of things. You know, she'll go to jail. I'm, I think they'll all go to jail, actually. I'm, I'm not quite sure about Samson. But, um, but if, if one of them cracks, they can treat it as evidence. But if they don't crack, they can do what they did in the Lone Star case and decide anyway that that was their motivation. Uh, and if by any miracle of justice the verdict is not guilty, um, I think this guilty, this not guilty verdict will come out, it'll be drawn out, so that hopefully people will be thinking of something else. Maybe the impeachment of Moon Jae-in or uh, An Chol Su or something will be the new issue. And then Park Gane is called, kind of mm, not guilty, but not. Uh, the clue to all this, what I'm saying, by the way, is that I bet you Park Gane is, I bet you she's jailed, but I bet you she's pardoned in a couple of years. Which is the system's way of saying, you know, you're not really guilty of anything. You're just there because we all got angry. Yeah. So, um, to come to my conclusion, um, here's my theory. Um, Korea was culturally and politically a very authoritarian place until quite recently. The dictatorships have gone. The dictators were kicked out, as represented by that fine drawing that I stole off the internet. Uh, after go I actually Googled kicking somebody out um, and found these images. Um, and in its place, I think, into the vacuum has moved this notion of public sentiment uh, which I think is the prevailing idea, and I think it's temporary, but I think it's the prevailing idea of what democracy is now. Democracy is doing the will of the people, and the will of the people is expressed through public sentiment. Therefore, I, the bureaucrat, and the politician, and the tax official, and the prosecutor, must follow what public sentiment is telling me to do. Okay. But, um, if the thing is that, um, okay, let me say something nice about uh, public sentiment first of all. Uh, public sentiment in, very way, in, in many ways, as I kind of alluded to earlier, it represents a sort of the moral heart of the people. This is why people feel so strongly about it. Um, there are some people who, I mean, you see banners around, say that this thing I said before, that uh, I had up there before, of public sentiment is the will of God. Um, you know, that it's the essence of democracy. Um, and people feel that, feel that very strongly, but obviously the, the people can't decide on every single issue. You know, Do we need another set of traffic lights in Kwangamun? How about a referendum? No, you have officials that decide stuff like that. So you need representatives and institutions. So a functioning democracy is a very complex uh, system checks and balances, representation, things like that. It's not just the mob shouting. Um, I'll tell you one area, by the way, just a complete digression, where we do need to hear from the people, and that's in consumer. You know there's no consumer groups in this country to speak of. Um, that's one area where they should be, but anyway, that's another thing. Um, so, in matters of justice, the system should stand even if it means defending one person against the entire country. In fact, that's the, the test of the moral core of, of a system of justice, um, if that happens. So, what I would say um, is that 
I think these two gents, one of them is going to be our next president. Um, so, after the election ne next month, the, the new government is likely to address the notion of limiting presidential power. I think this is going to, this was sort of on the cards before, but it's, I think it's going to be one of the outcomes of this whole event, which will be good for Korea. But what I think they should also be doing is limiting the power of public sentiment. Now, perhaps that, that you don't express it in that way, um, but what they need to be doing is to somehow encourage debate. That the, the needs to be, uh, you know, a democracy is a, is a, it, everything's fought out with words, and that there's not. I mean, obviously, people do debate here, but it's not not enough. And the other thing is, they need to. There needs to be a strengthening of democratic institutions, so that people follow. The, the, the people in charge, the judges and so on, follow the spirit of the, the letter of the law and don't bend it uh, to follow the spirit of public sentiment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Now we have a few minutes. Questions? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm curious if you have any predictions or prophecies or anything like that about how public sentiment might affect what's going on geopolitically, considering China, U.S. election effect on that. Um, you mean you mean Korea's relationships with the U.S. Well, and I guess China? It's a, it's a both ways. I'm, I'm wondering if you have any the election here. And what's going on geopolitically? There might be a yeah. back and forth there. I mean, I think uh, it's interesting, you know, about the anti-American. Um, the, the, there is there is a limit to public sentiment. I think what I've tried to describe is how um, the institutions of democracy, particularly the National Assembly, who are the lawmakers, and the courts. Um, do not, um, uh, they don't sort of act against the floodgate. So sort of when a tsunami of public sentiment comes in, they just follow it. And I'm overstating that to make a point because, you know, this country system is not as bad as that. But in, in certain big cases, that seems to be what happens. Um, and I think that there needs to be a strengthening of those walls for the sake of democracy. But there are other walls in place. Like, despite all the anti-Americanism, uh, the American alliance is too important for the country, the strategic national interest of the country, to be changed by a million people waving candles on the street. You know, so I'm not sure uh, the extent to which relations with China with the U.S. going to be impacted by public by public sentiment unless something very untoward were to happen. For example, if the U.S. were, I don't think they will, but if the U.S. would like to bomb North Korea suddenly, and everybody got fury, the Chinese, everybody got fury, and, and, and there'd be a couple of million, there'd be bigger, more numbers out in the street than here, again, whether that would um, have an impact, whether it would shift the relate, nature of the relationship with the U.S. and bring the country closer to China, I don't know. What, what I'm sort of out of my depth on that. In the other direction, what kind of effect do you think the naval group scheming north in the sea of Japan now will have on the election? Which, oh, our election here. Well, I haven't thought of it that way. I don't think it's, I think, I think it's posturing right now, frankly. Um, uh, I think something's got to happen for the election to really be impacted. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I'm right. Um, somebody else might have a better answer to that, but, yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. Another question. Oh, no, the back, this one. Hi, right, guys. I was wondering, when you talk about public sentiment, um, and why, why you think Korea will change. Um, if I look at the Western world, I mean, in Australia, for example, public sentiment is called public sentiment. The yeah. idea is you take your dynamics to your local board and hold just before closing time, and everyone's pissed as a new and take a straw pot. And that then becomes you know, policy. But <laughs> it seems to me that in, in sort of Western world we've seen public sentiment is being replaced by the voting cycle. You know, 
people in the panel are making decisions on the basis that I need to be re-elected because you know, my wife and wife and everything is related to me. So I'm wondering if, you know, why are we expecting Korea to change to what maybe democracy should be, whereas there's the whole democratic well, two reasons, two responses really. One is that, you know, we're expats and it's our job to tell the country what to do. And uh, <laughs> this is one thing that I'm trying to encourage you to decide that this is how this change. Uh, but the other thing is, is that some things seem so intractable, but this country changes. I think everything is up for change in this country. So I think, I, I see this as a, what I tried to describe earlier about um, authoritarians leave, in comes public sentiment. It's like the masses, the people, the collective, and their emotions. So it's almost like they're the new tyranny, if you like. Uh, that's a bit of an overstatement. But I think it's temporary. Um, I think people are aware of this anyway. So I would see the strengthening of uh, institutions um, as I, I would say, sort of in the next 10 to 20 years, this might be a non a non issue. Because um, I'm very optimistic, everything changes in this country. Yeah. So that, that's my simple response. Um, you know, everything changes. This will change. I'm sure. I don't think it's going to be here for another hundred years. Jesus Christ was welcomed in Jerusalem. And uh, some days later, they were asking to crucify him. So uh, that is public opinion. I, I mean, and this is not very new that politicians or the people in power react to to the public. Uh, but do you consider this somehow special, different from well, where I come here, come from Germany or whatever, where where chancellors, of course, very much look to the polls and and I think sometimes change. Uh, what they wanted to do into what they actually do. So uh, some people remind them what they promised in elections. So is that a dangerous thing? No, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to... Um, I, I appreciate the question because I may not have uh, expressed myself clearly enough. Um, you know, clearly, um, public sentiment, public feeling, popular opinion, um, and all of those things clearly are very, very important and they influence policy. This is politics, this is how politics work. Um, let's think of an example, Uber, okay? When Uber started, the laws weren't in place for about apps and things like that. And if they sat and waited for, for governments to create laws, they'd be waiting for five years, by which time the apps would be outdated anyway. So they just come in deliberately breaking the law. And the whole strategy in Europe and in, uh, in the democratic countries, basically, break the law, uh, take on the taxis, infuriate the establishment, and then here come the satisfied customers um, lobbying in their defense. And that's what happened in most cases. In here it didn't, because there's no consumer voice. Um, they came up against the taxi lobby, so that's a different story. So in that sense, the role of what people feel and think is very, very important. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. I think it's a good thing. And there's freedom here to express yourself. Um, I mean, there are people right outside that government building every day with placards and shouting at them. You know, when I first came here, they'd be pulled around the back and have the shit beat there. Literally, I mean, they would. You saw this sort of thing going on, you know. Um, so, but what I'm talking about is justice. You know, the institutions of justice um, are very strong pillars upon which a democracy rests. And if they're swayed, if people, if judges are going, uh, read the paper, call the people, the people uh, really don't like this defendant, um, I think I'm going to find her guilty. Otherwise, I'm going to be criticised. Where's the justice?